Okay, I, are all of you able to hear me? Yeah, okay, all right, thank you, Rin. All right, so welcome to uh, week 10 of our class. Um, we have been going through different parts of elements of uh, marriage and family, and we've uh, covered a couple of chapters up until now. We're still in that, uh, in the same, um, a topic, and we're going to be looking at other uh, elements of uh, marriage. Uh, we, like I did mention, we're not going chronologically in your book or in the text that's given. Um, that's because of, of just um, for easier categorization, I've just kind of um, uh, divided the entire course into smaller bits. So right now, we're looking at elements of um, marriage. And we're going to be looking at uh, uh, lesson 13. And if you have your books with you, we're on page 135. Um, or if you've taken, if you're looking at the soft copy, we're at page 136. Okay, so we're going to be uh, discussing this today. But before we get started, just a quick recap about what we covered last week. So it would be great if some of you could just share um, your insights on what was covered last week. So you could go ahead. OK. Would, would someone like to start? Anyone? Shiv Kumar, Nikhil? Pasi, can you hear me? No. Uh, not very clear in, once again. Hello? Yeah, yeah, now it's better. Yes, I can hear you now. Um, so, Pasi, last time we talked about uh, managing our home, uh, where the husband and the wife share the workload in the, in the home and not just, and not just leave it um, to one person. But mm -hmm. uh, do it as a team and mm -hmm. just work together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. We covered one more chapter. Anyone else? Anand, Nikhil, Shivkumar. Yes, students. We covered chapter eight. We better stop. Yeah, chapter eight. What is chapter eight? It's absolute silence. Jackin, would you like to help? What did we cover in chapter eight? We saw about um, our uh, the sexual health and hygiene, and also uh, sex. How it's uh, come it's an expression of uh, marriage, honoring mm -hmm. and commitment, and how mm -hmm. God uh, directed our uh, God has kept it for marriage. And mm -hmm. He had designed it for the marriage and uh, the the enjoyment after marriage. So mm -hmm. certain aspects of uh, sex and uh, how God has designed it for us. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jacqueline. Yes. So these were the two chapters that we looked into. We're going to be uh, focusing on another chapter on boundaries. Okay, We're going to um, uh, understand of what it means to instill certain fences um uh, right you know when uh, after marriage okay so to just 
probably give you start with an introduction. Now, even uh, marriage in itself, when a when a person's married, it does not automatically uh, keep you away or insula insulate you from be from having affections to those of the opposite sex. Okay, and uh, uh, so it it is still true that a married man or a married woman can feel attraction towards others. And uh, these, the affections that are created outside of marriage often does it, begins in a very, very uh, simple, casual way, um, either with someone who, who you may be spending time with, maybe at workplace, or with, uh, uh, you know, maybe with a uh, with a friend and this uh, the, this can uh, so maybe it starts off with good intentions but it can lead to uh, emotional affections which can further lead to an entanglement which can lead to uh, an involvement okay? and the impact of these um, uh, emotional connections or attachments can cause severe uh, harm to the marriage. Okay, so we need to know, and, and I think so. Uh, in short, that marriage does not isolate you uh, from uh, any from from having other affections. Uh, so, what do we do? Is to create or guard our marriage, or guard uh, our minds, guard the way that we feel or guard our affections towards forming attachments like this, okay? So uh, this is, even, even if you are a highly spiritual person, it, it doesn't, your spirituality doesn't, uh, may not guard you, okay? You may be also involved uh, in ministry, involved in, uh, in spiritual disciplines, however, we can all be vulnerable to this to this area in this area okay so we must recognize that there can be a threat or a danger um, and we need to do all guard all that we have in in order to ensure that we protect our marriage so this is basically the focus of the marriage of how we can establish and develop certain boundaries, certain fences, and also being aware of um, uh, how we need to keep ourselves away from these temptations, away from these attacks, OK? So uh, we'd like to look into scripture to see uh, the, the you know, it's, it's great to see that, that scripture makes a reference, or it brings about this teaching in a in very vivid manners and if you if you would look at it all through proverbs um uh, what's been written by solomon it's been shared you know he brings about the danger or brings about uh how we need to be wise in this area okay so let's just take some time to just to read some of these scriptures and then we will we will begin to unpack that um, so can can someone read Proverbs chapter two verses sixteen to twenty two? Proverbs two sixteen to twenty two. Um, uh, there are many verses, but I'll just probably take the bigger ones. And Proverbs seven twenty one to twenty six. So either uh, two people in the group can can read that. Proverbs two sixteen to twenty two, and Proverbs seven twenty one to twenty six. Proverbs 2, verse 16 to 22. To deliver you from the immoral woman, from the seductress who flatters with her words, who forsakes the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God. For her house leads down to death and her paths to death. None who go to her return, nor do they regain the paths of life. So you may walk in the way of goodness and keep to the paths of righteousness. For the upright will dwell in the land and the blameless will remain in it.
Ma'am, can you repeat it? Prabhu, you can read. Please go ahead. Okay, I think I'll just go go ahead reading. Pro Ma'am, it's English. Sorry, sorry. I think I'm getting on mute. For some reason. Okay. I will go ahead and read Proverbs 7 21 to 26. So she tempted him with her charms and he gave in to her smooth talk. Suddenly he was going with her like an ox on the way to be slaughtered, like a deer prancing into a trap. Where an arrow would pierce its heart, he was like a bird going into a net. He did not know that his life was in danger. Now then, sons, listen to me. Pay, pay attention to what I say. Do not let such a woman win your heart. Don't go wandering after her. She has been the ruin of many men and caused the death of too many to count. OK, so from this, um, what, what we are reading and what scripture really highlights is to be careful about the seductress, okay, to beware of the temptress. I think in Proverbs 2, verse 16, some versions say a temptress, some say the smooth talking seductress, especially you know, the one that has uh, um, her ways or her life not in the straight path and lures other people to join her. Okay, so it, it brings about a picture it brings about an observation of how um, it's it, it's quite easy to understand that there are there are people of this kind around and we are called to be there. So when you, uh, I'm I'm sure even as um, you know you've been through uh, you you you're in uh, in the places of either your work or in the places of where you're staying. Um, wherever you're at, you definitely do see um, uh, evidences of people having extramarital affairs, people going through um, one night stands, there's unfaithfulness in the marriage. Um, there, are, there are so many, uh, so many uh, things that go on around us. Okay. And uh, we, we understand now, even, even as uh, people, um, tend to accept it as something that is that is uh, that is current, that is trending, right? So it is it's something that is prevalent. You will see it all around us. So you will see in workplaces how people freely flirt with one another, okay? Or they are using certain ways, or they make suggestions in in, in order to attract one another into romantic relationships without really uh, regarding you know, marriage in itself. And they are, often you'd find that people are just attracted into these kinds of immoral relationships. And uh, so, like I said, it could be a one night stand or it could be uh, an affair that keeps going on. Many, many people actually fall into this trap, okay? And uh, on the other hand, you would also see there are people waiting, uh, men or women waiting to uh, to catch on to a next to, to an, another person 
to have a relationship, okay, an adulterous relationship. And often you see this very commonly in a workplace, in a workplace setting. So scripture is, is really helping us to see how we should see, we should have wisdom and we should use our prudence to stay away and even recognize that this can be the agenda of people, that can be this um, seducing that takes place. Okay, so, so scripture has spoken about it long before you and I have actually, uh, you know, even, even known of it and even, even see it. Now, uh, it's, it's good to understand or, uh, you know, uh, look at because often when people get into an adulterous or an extramarital relationship, um, it does not happen all at once. It doesn't happen when you see the person and you decide on that. It generally doesn't happen. Most cases, it doesn't happen. Uh, what what it, it is, the way that it happens, it's a very, very slow process. It's something that takes time or, uh, you know, that there are, there are certain, maybe, let's say, progressions of how that happened, OK? Um, it's it, so initially it's it's just probably talking to someone you're spending time with someone uh, maybe at a difficult time or you know you may be having an okay time but you interact with someone spend a lot of time with someone and there begins to be a conviction that the person you're spending time with maybe is better than your own spouse or that your spouse is not good enough, or there is a certain comparison that comes about that, okay, this person listens to me more, spends time with me, finds out things about me, and there's a comparison about what's not happening in the marriage. And so when that begins, soon there becomes a dissatisfaction in the marriage. And when that happens, there's a lot more of emotional open, openness, where you are connecting with the other person a lot more emotionally. And when that connection happens, there are uh, there is emotional bonding that happens or emotional affections that take place. So, so it may come up a very casual relationship. The more that you spend time, the more that you uh, are able to share with each other, there are uh, uh, emotional an emotional bonding that happens or an emotional affection that happens, and then it slowly um, it slowly moves into an entanglement. Okay. What is an entanglement where you, you are thinking about the person or you're waiting for those interactions with the person, either through a meeting or through phone calls or through texting or any other way that you can actually meet with the person. So that becomes an entanglement. Now, this entanglement, when there is an entanglement, there is a lot more of sharing that takes place and, and an increased interaction that takes place, which moves into a place of being secret, secret uh, about being secretive about things, you know, sharing secret things with the other person or meeting them in, in secret places or lying to the spouse and, and you know, going to meet, meet them because that emotional entanglement has, has happened. Now, this, uh, when this happens, it isn't long before uh, it moves into a physical or a sexual uh, relationship. And that's and then it, there is an involvement sexually and uh, uh, and it it comes to a place of getting into an affair or getting into adultery. okay? And then it becomes it becomes a life of secrecy, right? It becomes a life of uh, hiding that things are kept away from from the other person okay so um it is it is a slow fade okay and we read this in proverbs 9 17 to 18 i'll read this it says stolen water is sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant but he does not know that the that the dead are there that her guests are in the depth of hell so you see what is eaten in secret is pleasant. So it becomes pleasurable because it is done in secret, right? Now, uh, it's a good thing to check and understand uh, as to why people fall into this. What is some of the reasons why people fall into um, uh, this, this kind of a sin? 
So one of the first things is probably the hurts that are there um, in the marriage. You know, very often when when um, uh, when the relationship when there are emotional hurts, it isn't spoken about, it isn't discussed, it isn't shared, it isn't it isn't um, uh, dealt with, it isn't addressed these hurts tend to take root. It begins to fester, it begins to rot uh, to a sense that there is a sense of emotional loneliness that you feel. Uh, it, it brings about that feeling of not feeling loved by the other spouse. Okay, There can be a sense of abandonment, a sense of a rejection. Uh, in marriages, there can also be unmet needs, that uh, emotional needs that go unmet, uh, where, uh, where, where the person feels that the other person doesn't understand. Okay, there could be uh, expectations that are unfulfilled. People get into marriage wanting or thinking that marriage would uh, occur a certain way, but that doesn't take place, and and as a result, there is there is um, those expectations aren't met, and and there in itself, they, there is a seeking out that happens. Or there could be some kind of a pain or a situational crisis or experience which has caused an emotional trauma. Um, and as a result, they fall into this. Or it can be past relationships. Maybe they are affections that have, that have, um, that have been, uh, that started way back in school or uh, in late adolescence. And as a result of which, uh, you know, this uh, maybe a connection again brings back these these um, uh, uh, these relationships. So if if some of these have not been dealt with or any other kind of emotional issues, so all that we spoke about were emotional issues, right? So if that isn't dealt with, uh, there is a huge tendency or people are vulnerable to these extramarital affairs. Sometimes um, there could also be issues with personality or issues with with the, with the way that they they see um, morals or moral standards, right? Uh, not really uh, holding godly standards in their lives and and thinking that it's okay to break marriages or it's okay to have multiple relationships or it it is it could be a place where a, a person willingly compromises what their maybe the values that they had and what their values that they stood for not having those values it's all it could also be uh, even for for those who may be christians could could have a low commitment a poor commitment to what god's word says and what um what god's word desires for marriage or it can be a poor commitment to one's one's spouse one's um one's own spouse or uh um you know uh, just not seeing that living in sin can can be very detrimental to a relationship. Often the people say, you know, oh, oh, what what's wrong if I am not, uh, you know, if my spouse doesn't know, or what's wrong if it's a one night stand and uh, you know my spouse never even found out. That shows it's it's a poor understanding of what sin is or a low tolerance of sin. Now these often also make people very prone to having these immoral relationships. The other some other some reasons that um, uh, people may have is that that the sense of excitement, wanting to seek that sense of excitement and uh, you know and, and something to look forward for uh, outside of of the marriage or uh, a, a need to feel entitled um, because you know when when there is success or when there is power or when when someone has authority they feel they are entitled to very many things so these are some of the reasons why people do fall into sin like this okay any questions <laughs> Are we all good? Are we all here? Are we all following? Okay, all right. Okay, great. Okay, so um, let's move on then. So as 
um, you know, what, wh what are the lessons that we learn or what are we actually called to do? So um, uh, let's look at, uh, uh, at, at the life of David, okay, and what really happened and what are some of the principles that we can take from David's life? So would someone pick up from 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 1 to 4? Could somebody please read that? 2 Samuel 11, verses 1 to 4. When that time of year came around again, the anniversary of the Ammonite aggression, David dispatched Joab, Job and his fighting men of Israel in full force to destroy the Ammonites for good. They laid siege to Rabbah, but David stayed in Jerusalem. One late afternoon, David got up from taking his nap and was strolling on the roof of the palace. From his vantage point of the roof, he saw a woman, woman bathing. The woman was stunningly beautiful. David sent to ask about her and was told, Isn't this Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam and wife of Uriah the Hittite? David sent his agents to get her. After she arrived, he went to bed with her. This occurred during the time of purification, following her period. Then she returned home. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Okay, yeah. So this is a this is a very uh, uh, a common story, a common lesson, uh, a common story that we've all heard. But we'll just pick up some insights uh, and understanding from what the what are some of the things that we need to take care of. Okay, uh, we know that uh, when we're looking at the life of King of David, we do see. A couple of things about him that uh, you know, and, and you read so much about David that you know that he loved, uh, uh, he really loved God. He was a man who um, had faith. He was a man who did what God wanted him to do, uh, and God raised him from a place of being a shepherd boy into a place of being a king. So I mean, you can just imagine uh, the you know, if you have have like a quick. Uh, flip over of his life how much you see that god worked in his life and i'm and i'm pretty sure and uh, you know the psalms speak of it as to how he regarded as god as as his lord and his king and always giving thanks to him for what what had happened now through him becoming a king and after he became the king of israel we do see that uh, there were a lot of victories that he won Okay, um, I'll just read from scripture in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 8, verses, um, verses 13 onwards. So it reads, David became very famous. After his return, he destroyed 18,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt. He placed army garrisons throughout Edom. And all the Edomites became David's subjects. This was another example of how the Lord made David victorious wherever he went. Okay, And it says, David reigned over all Israel um, and was fair to everyone. So if you look at this, you see how famous and how successful David had become. Okay, But if you look in verse 1, it says, when the time of year came around again, I'll just read it from one of the versions I have. Uh, so, so it says, the following spring, the time of the year when kings go to war. Okay, So it says when kings go to war, which means that was the time of the year when kings were doing their job, which is you know, going to war. What did David do? He sent his army and Joab to, uh, to fight the Ammonites. And, uh, but what does David do? He stays behind in Jerusalem. So one of the first things we do understand is that um, um, here David, when he was to do something, there was a purpose that he was there for as king, left that purpose and stayed back because um, he must have been in the peak of his success, right? Knowing that it wasn't necessary for him to go. 
and there is where he falls into this temptation okay so uh, what do we see here is that there can be times where when we may be in the heightened a uh, time of heightened um, success or at a time of significant difficulty we generally could be putting our guards down right at the time of success we may not be very careful or at the time of deep distress is again a time where we all the way we may be most vulnerable and we are not careful we let our guards down and it is during this time that we do see that our judgment about things uh, may be very poor and as a result we may be making wrong choices or wrong decisions and we tend to fall into uh, into into sin uh, uh, at these times normally when at, at uh, when may at normally we probably are able to walk away from the, from from sin so it is so what what is the learning that we have? what is the insight that we have it is needed for us to be on double guard to be really careful to ensure that we keep our antennae our defenses up during times of great success or during times of great conflicts okay because it's just a momentary decision uh, a, th a, a thoughtless decision that we may take that can have very, very lasting consequences in our life. So, so at, at the point of time when we when we say no, it's okay, it's just this, or it's all right, maybe it's just text, or it's just a ride, or it's just a visit, um, uh, you know, or anything like that can put us to a place of weakness. Um, which could which could definitely bring about our fall or bring about um, uh, us lure, getting lured into that temptation. So that's that's a lesson that we we learn from David's life. Okay. Uh, now, even as we're talking about being on guard, uh, Scripture also um, also talks about how we need to know, and and we'll read that. Um, uh, that that portion once once uh, again is we we need to be aware of not trading something that we have that is enduring that is lasting that we can enjoy for a long period of time to something that is momentary that can be just for the fun of it or for the thrill of it as people would say right so leaving something that is lasting that will endure that is a blessing for something that can be of momentary fulfillment or a momentary satisfaction so uh, this this proverbs 5 verses 1 to 23 actually brings about a contrast of of this of a of a, a cheap thrill as against something that is that you have as enduring okay uh, so would someone please read that proverbs chapter 5 verses 1 to 23 could someone please read that proverbs 5 1 to 23 dear friend play pay close attention to this my wisdom listen very closely to the way i say it then you inquire, acquire a taste for good sense, and what I tell you will keep you out of trouble. The lips of a selective, a selective woman are oh so sweet. Her soft words are oh so smooth. But it won't be long before she's gravel in your mouth, a pain in your gut, a wound in your heart. She's dancing down the primrose path to death. She's headed straight for hell and taking you with her. She hasn't a clue about real life, about who she is or where she is going. So, my friend, listen closely. Don't treat my words casually. Keep your distance from such a woman. Absolutely stay out of a neighborhood. You don't want to squander your wonderful life to waste your precious life among the hard-hearted. Why should you allow strangers to take advantage of you? Why be exploited by those who care nothing for you? You don't want to end your life full of regrets, nothing but sin and bones. 
saying, Oh, why didn't I do what they told me? Why did I reject the discipline in life? Why didn't I listen to my mentors or take my teachers seriously? My life is ruined. I haven't one blessed thing to show for my life. Do you know the saying? Drink from your own rain barrel. Draw water from your own spring-fed well. It's true. Otherwise, you may one day come home and find your barrel empty and your well polluted. Your water is for you and you only, not to be passed around among strangers. Bless your fresh flowing fountain. Enjoy the wife you married as a young man. Lovely as an angel, be beautiful as a rose. Don't ever quit taking delight in her body. Never take her love for granted. Why would you trade enduring intimacies for cheap thrills with a wolf? For dalliance with a promiscuous stranger. Mark well that God does, doesn't miss a move you make. He's aware of every step you take. The shadow of your sin will overtake you and you'll find yourself stumbling all over yourself in the dark. Death is the reward of an undisciplined life. Your foolish decisions trap you in a dead end. Okay. Thank you, Ren. Thank you. Right. So this through this, um, like we said, it brings about what is a, a momentary um, momentary satisfaction as against that which can be enduring, which can be satisfied. So momentary things, momentary decisions for those thrills is something that can destroy you, that can ruin you. Okay? And uh, what does it say about uh, an enduring relationship? It, say, it, it, um, uh, uh, it uh, parallels it to a fresh flowing fountain uh, it's verse 18 i think in uh in in mine it says let your wife be a fountain of blessing for you so that is what it is that is what your spouse is um uh, paralleled to is is um bought meant to right that she is a fountain of blessing and uh, it also talks of how um, uh, it, how how God instructs uh, a person not to get lost or trade this long-lasting intimacy with that of a momentary thrill. Okay, and it it is something that you enjoy with your spouse, and it is it's something that you've been given to enjoy with your spouse. So take heed, take take care of that instruction. And this is what um, the uh, author of Proverbs is actually telling us, to take heed that not to trade it for something that is that is momentary, all right? Um, the, the next thing that when we, when we look into scripture, scripture gives us what are the consequences of such uh, a behavior or such a lifestyle of, of maybe of adultery. What, what is uh, the consequence? What can happen as a result? So let's just uh, read through this um, uh, Pro uh, Proverbs chapter 6, verses 23 to 35. Can someone please read that? Proverbs 6, 23 to 35. Can anyone else read it? Uh, I think Burin takes the initiative to read it every time. Can somebody else read, please? Proverbs chapter 6, verse 19. For the command is of the law, and the law of light, eight words of instruction of the way of life, to keep you from the evil woman, from the flattering tongue of the silent dress. Do not lust after her beauty in your heart, nor let her allure you with her eyelids. For by means of a harlot, man is reduced to a crust of bread, and an adulteress will prey upon his precious head. Till 35. Can a man take fire to his person, and his clothes not be burnt? Can one walk on the half to fourth words, and his feet not be seen? So is he who goes into his neighbor's wife. Whoever touches her shall not be innocent. 
people do not despise a thing if he steals to satisfy himself when he is starving. And when he is found, he must restore sevenfold. He may have to give up all the substance of his house. Whoever commits adultery with a woman lacks understanding. He who does so destroys his own soul. Wounds and dishonor he will get, and his reproach will not be wiped away. For jealousy is a husband's glory. Therefore, he will not spare in the day of vengeance. He will accept no recompense, nor will he be appeased, though you give many gifts. Okay, thank you, Anand. So, so it, it, it gives you an understanding of what happens uh, when someone engages in adultery. It is something that will destroy you. So it says, um, can you build a fire in your lap and not burn your pants? Can you walk barefoot on hot coals and not get blisters? Verse 29, it's the same way when you you have sex with your neighbor's wife. So it's it's talking or it's highlighting about how adultery is something that is going to destroy you. Even if you are going to engage in it, it is going to destroy you because verse 33, Proverbs uh, 6, verse 33, uh, sorry, I'm just looking at it up at, at another uh, version. It says, wounds and constant disgrace will be your lot. Your shame will not be erased, which means you're, you're the one, when you get into that, it is going to be hell. It is going to be something that you're going to be carrying in for a long time. And the shame is not something that will be erased. So it is, it's, it's something that you expect to destroy you, okay? So it's talking about how serious adultery can be. Adultery can be something that can destroy your soul, destroy uh, your relationships, destroy that which is stable, destroy uh, your relationship with God. So it's talking about how destructive it is, although the pleasure seems quite momentary, okay? Now, having understood this, there are some uh, some principles or some guidelines that we can understand or we can think about, okay? Uh, and there are some instructions that are given for us so that uh, you know we we are we are also judicious in the way that we um, relate with one another. So one of the things that we just want to highlight is. Uh, one or two instructions or rec recommendations for women is one is for women to stay on guard, to be careful. Because when you look at, um, uh, uh, you know, when you look at, when you look at the world around, you understand and you know that there are going to be people or there are people who are waiting to prowl or waiting to, um, uh, you know, waiting to violate you, right? So it it is bringing about the the instruction to be careful um, because there can be people who look for women who are vulnerable so that they can seduce them into something that is uh, immoral, right? So it's a it's a caution. It's a word of caution for women of uh, whether whether you're married or whether you're single, to be on guard, to be prudent, to be careful about what, what will happen. Because if you look at Proverbs 14.1, it says, homes are made by the wisdom of women, but are destroyed by foolishness, right? So the, the kind of power or the kind of um, uh, uh, plan that God has for women is to ensure to keep wise to stay wise with them so it's a it's a it's a word of caution um so it is to remember that as a wife or as a woman you are your husband's pride as it says in proverbs 12 4 uh, the, uh, a wife is her husband's pride and joy so it is important to stand on guard to stand careful without um without being vulnerable to 
be used or to be violated by other people around because often uh, uh, you know if if women, if if there are, if women may not be careful anything that someone would say could feel especially if you are in a marriage that is um emotion that, that that is an emotional drain on the marriage anyone anybody says could make uh, somebody feel a sense of be belonging a sense of being wanted so it says women stay on guard another instruction uh, that we that we read is um, uh, of how uh, it is important for women to dress modestly okay uh, the one part of the way a woman, um, a defense or the way that we protect, a woman protects herself is by the way that she dresses. Okay. Uh, it's a known factor that men are generally turned on by what they see visually. Okay. And so if a woman is, uh, is uh, puts on clothes, that are that are aren't um, modest or may not cover their parts of the body well enough. It definitely gets the attention of men. So it is a setting up of for unnecessary trouble for a woman. Okay. So it is proper for a woman to be modest, to be sensible about her clothing, and we see this in First Timothy uh, two verses nine to ten. I'll just uh, read that from. Um, I'll just read that first Timothy uh, chapter two, verses nine and ten. Okay, so it reads, um, and I want women to be modest in their appearance. They should wear decent and appropriate clothing, and not draw attention to themselves by the way they fix their hair or by wearing gold or pearls or expensive clothes. For women who claim to be devoted to God should make themselves attractive by the things that they do, by the good things that they do. Okay, so it is, um, it's, a, it's a way uh, to be careful. It's just an instruction for women also to be careful because of the way that God's made men, God's made women, uh, men being attracted by what they see and women needing to be prudent about what they wear so that, you know, we stay on guard and we don't set ourselves in for trouble, okay? Um, now, before we get into this, into another next portion is what happens? What happens if uh, if someone has got into adultery or if someone has uh, taken this pathway? What do we, what can be done? So we will look at that in the next one. Huh? But then we have around two minutes, and I just want to pause for any questions that we may have. Or any questions or any thoughts, any um, you can bring up any reflections, anything. Okay, if we don't have any questions, let's take a break. Uh, it's 10.49 on my clock. Let's come back uh, by 11, we will resume uh, into our next hour.